Hello, everybody. My name is Anastasia. I'm the program manager at NAMI Santa Cruz County. That's the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We work to support, advocate for, and educate all those affected by mental health challenges. Um, there is a NAMI in every single county. Right now, I am coming to you with NAMI Santa Cruz County. But wherever you are, if you had to move back in with your parents during this strange time, there's probably a NAMI near you. So the resources that I'll be talking um, some of the resources I will be mentioning today for you guys, they will probably be available through your affiliate as well. So if you look up NAMI, National Alliance Mental Illness, and your county, you should be able to find your affiliate. Um, so I'm going to be going through a basic mental health presentation with you guys today, uh, just about what is mental health, what are mental health conditions, and how do I support myself or a friend who is experiencing some challenges? Um, I would appreciate some leniency from you guys today because I'm doing this all in one take because I have no idea how to edit videos. Um, so there's probably gonna be some stumbling and some strange moments. So I apologize for that in advance and hope you guys will forgive me. Also, my cat is right here and she might just walk in front of my screen at any given moment. I cannot really control that. <laughs> um, a little bit about myself. I am not a mental health provider, so I am just, I'm not a psychiatrist or a therapist. I'm just somebody with her own lived experience. So I have, I live with bipolar disorder and I've had diagnoses of anxiety and major depressive disorder throughout the years. And I'll be sharing some of those experiences with you guys as well. Um, so I think that's all my intro spiel. Um, we are also gonna have some two very special guests come on at the end of this, sharing their own stories about what it's like to live with mental health challenges. Um, and I hope you guys will find that helpful. I know a lot of us are really struggling with our mental health right now, especially if we've had uh, pre-existing conditions before. And even a lot, of, a, a lot of you without those are struggling with your mental health. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about how we can support ourselves and our loved ones. So let's get started. I hope this screen share works. Okay, perfect. All right. So what is mental health? Mental health is something that every single one of us has, just like we have physical health. Some of us have to work a little bit harder to support our mental health, um, just like some of us have to work a little bit harder to support our physical health. Um, but mental health is essentially a state of balance in your mind, which is the way you're thinking, the way you're feeling, and the way that you're acting. And being able to um, have some practices for emotional regulation, so being able to deal with stressful or negative emotions in a positive way. Um, and also a lot of psychologists define mental health uh, as also a state in which you can experience joy. Not constantly, not all the time, but a place where you're able to, to feel content um, and, and some peace. Um, again, some of us have to uh, have some skills in place and have some habits, and all of us have to have habits in place to maintain our mental health. For some of us, we have to do a little bit more. So um, you guys all probably have some idea of what mental health is already. So I would ask you to think of three things that you either do right now or you can do to support your mental health. And I'll share some of mine with you guys after I give you a second to think without my voice. So a few things that I do to maintain my mental health are uh, mindfulness practices that has been extremely life-changing for, for me. Um, I deal with a lot of anxiety, so being able to pay attention to what I'm thinking and what I'm experiencing while I'm experiencing anxiety has been a total game changer. Um, also calling my loved ones and being in touch with my loved ones regularly. I know that when I'm not doing well, I'm not connecting with my loved ones. I'm not um, sharing whatever's going on if it's a negative experience. Um, and then the third thing that I do to support my mental health is get a lot of sleep. Um, that is something that's vitally important um, and really helps me to maintain a level of balance. And there's also things that we do to maintain our physical health, like eating well, exercising, sleeping, um, that are also very tied into our mental health as well. So there's a big overlap and we don't really get taught that enough, I think. Um, so if you're taking care of your physical health, chances are your mental health plays a big role in that as well. So what are mental health conditions? Here is a hundred words for what mental health conditions are. Um, and I think my face is probably in the way of one of those. But um, mental health conditions in the way that I'm going to be talking about today is um, 
we can think about it as physical health conditions like diabetes. I really like using that analogy because diabetes for some of some people with diabetes, they they have it at a very early age and they're basically born with it. Some people with diabetes develop it later on in their life for with a number number of factors that play into that, right? So the same thing can happen with mental health conditions. Mental health conditions can refer to a serious mental illness, which again is just a um, different neurotransmitters in the brain that cause you to react differently um, in how you're feeling, thinking, and behaving. Um, and mental health conditions can also be caused by situational events. So if you're having um, de experiencing depression or anxiety, um, mental health conditions can be triggered through that, through stressful life events, um, like losing a loved one. Um, so there's a number of ways that somebody can have or develop a mental health condition. And there's right now, there's not really a test where you can, you know, like spit in a bottle and say, uh, hey, I have this and this is why I have this. It's a very complex um, kind of study, but we are learning so much more about it with every single year. We know more about it today, uh, know, know more about mental health conditions today than we've ever known before. So it's a really good time um, to be getting support and to be learning about your mental health. Mental health conditions are medical conditions, which means they have symptoms, and it also means they have treatments. So um, a lot of times mental illness is called, or mental health conditions are called invisible illnesses. And I would argue that when you know what warning signs to look for, they are not invisible. Um, they are, you can, you can definitely spot them in yourselves and your loved ones. It's definitely a journey to come to accept the fact that somebody has a mental health condition. Um, but there are signs that point to our, our to, to somebody having this. Um, and again, it's something that affects the way that you think, feel, and act. And yes, they are very common. Um, the most common statistic that I see is one in four people live with a mental health condition. So if you're experiencing something and you're going, you're like feeling weird and you, you feel like something is wrong with you or you're broken, that's not the case. It is so common and there's absolutely resources out there for you to get support and to feel better. And that being said, mental health conditions are not anybody's fault. So I grew up in a church where my priest told me that I was possessed by the devil because I had depression. Um, and that was not helpful to me at all during that time. What I really needed was support from a mental health provider that I could um, talk to and work through my issues with. Um, and so, so, so all that being said, <laughs> it's not, it's not something that um, to blame anybody for. And it's something that, again, you can get help for, you can get treatment for. It's not something to be ashamed of, though shame is unfortunately part of the process of having a mental health condition because of so much stigma out there. Um, the, the way that, that our society sees mental health conditions um, is very blamey and very judgy. Um, and so that really plays a huge role in people seeking treatment. There's like, I think for most people with mental health conditions, it takes them up to seven years before, like having symptoms, it takes them seven years before they seek treatment um, because of stigma. And um, that's really not good because, and it's, you know, it's, it's part of our society, it's part of our process. That's not something to be ashamed of too, if you're like, oh God, I don't wanna to talk to anybody about this. Um, but the truth is that, again, there, the recovery is possible with mental health conditions. And the sooner that you get help, the better, right? Just like diabetes, um, if you get treatment earlier on, chances are you will be able to, to manage it or recover um, to an extent. And having a mental health condition doesn't mean that you can't achieve the things that you want to achieve. It will probably mean that you'll have to manage some expectations of your timelines, um, of the way that you do things, but it doesn't mean that you can't do what it is that you love to and want to do. So here are some warning signs of mental health conditions. Um, and these are just a few. I really want to specify that to no, when you're when you're looking at these, do not diagnose yourself. So any one of these can actually correspond with any mental health condition. So for the longest time, I was just Googling my symptoms and that's all I was doing for my mental health. Nothing else. I was just like, uh, I'm feeling suicidal or I'm feeling, um, you know, like nothing matters. And um, I was finding, you know, all of these symptoms about depression. 
turns out I did not have depression. I had bipolar disorder, um, but I was really focused on my, on my depression. And that's kind of the main thing that I was seeing. So um, I just really, I want to encourage you guys to, to educate yourselves and look up like, you know, what are the different mental health conditions and symptoms, but do not diagnose yourself when you get on there. We cannot have an objective perspective of ourselves um, without the help of a, 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 the help of a mental health professional can really bring to light what is actually going on. I'm not going to go through all these with you guys. This is just for you to have language for if something weird is going on with you or a friend. Um, th these are some things that you might be seeing. So to be able to like have something to go to your doctor with, um, to go to your friend with, uh, these, are, these are some of the warning signs. There's another slide after this um, with some more. But a couple of mine that I really wish I started having mental health challenges at a really early age. I, I remember having them regularly by the time that I was 12. Um, sorry, mental health, mental health conditions warning signs. I started having those at the age of 12 and, and probably before then. It's just that's the first time I remember it. A lot of, a lot of people get mental health conditions under, when they're under a lot of stress. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So it might be that like you've never really had issues before, but all of a sudden being in college, um, having a lot of work to do, that can bring up a lot, that can stir up a lot of stuff. So, so stress is a really big um, catalyst for mental health conditions. So for me, um, my two biggest warning signs were self-injury um, and panic attacks. And that um, I, I have found much better ways to cope with my pain and my emotional um, just overwhelm than self-injury. So right now I, I kind of joke that um, I now do hot yoga and that kind of speaks to, to um, you know, the kind of same tendencies that I did with self-injury because hot yoga is really hard. <laughs> Um, so I kind of feel like I'm beating myself up a little bit, but I know that what I'm doing is good for my body. And I always leave um, yoga feeling better. Whereas when I was experiencing self-injury, it would just make me feel worse. Even if for a moment I had this like relief of, oh, this pain is real. Um, when I wasn't really sure how to deal with my emotions. Um, the other thing that I have is panic attacks. I actually just had one last night because of the state of the world and everything is really overwhelming. Um, and for me, panic attacks, my brain just start like, it just goes on a one track and, and everything is bad. Like I start every little thing that could possibly be bad in my life or that I could see in like a bad way. That's all I think about when I'm having a panic attack. And it starts being, my thoughts start being really loud and really fast. And I, I like, I just cry a lot. That's I like cry and I, my breath gets really short. I can't breathe fully. So I'm like kind of hyperventilating. Um, and that's just something that I get. And that's something that I've had for as long as I can remember with, with treatment and with professional help, they have been so much more manageable and so much less frequent and so much less intense. Um, but I still have them. It's still, it's just part of my brain chemistry and what I have to learn to live with, but they're nowhere near as scary as when I first started having them and didn't know what to do. And everyone's panic attacks look kind of different. So if you, you think you have them, but they don't sound like what I'm experiencing, that's totally okay. Um, and you guys can see some other warning signs on this slide as well. Um, so this warning sign, so this warning sign slide, um, I just want to use to say that, uh, first of all, suicidal ideation is absolutely a sign of uh, needing mental health support. Um, and that is something that I went through and um, I really should have, I will, I will give you guys the number for um, you, you probably have it, but our local suicide prevention hotline 24 seven, you can call them anytime just to talk. You don't even have to be in a crisis. Um, just know that there's support out there for you. And yes, you can feel better. I have gone through it. Um, and, and I'm so glad that I reached out and got support when I did, because I'm feeling nothing like when I felt, um, very, very bad when I was in that place feeling suicidal. So that's a really big signal of needing mental health support. Um, also, you will see substance use and um, uh, behaviors of, of eating disorders on this slide as well. And that's just to note that those two things are also mental health conditions in and of themselves. So um, if you, you yourself or you know somebody who is using substances a lot, um, that is a mental health disorder. Substance use disorder is actually a thing. And there's, again, lots of great treatments, lots of great support for that. Um, and unfortunately, it's something that a lot of us use to deal with our, our, our pain and our, our um, again, emotional overwhelm. Um, and there's, there's so many things out there that will help you 
deal with what you're feeling with the with the deep feelings painful feelings that you're feeling without also hurting your body um and i will give you guys some of those resources at the end as well actually i'm going to give them to you right now <laughs> so what you can do for yourself um there are so many resources again so it can feel so hopeless when you're in the middle of it it can feel like there's nobody out there that could possibly understand um it could feel like every time you try to talk about it somebody either like shuts you down makes you feel like it's not worth talking about um or or is like trying to like solve everything and puts you in a crisis state that doesn't help, right? Um, I highly recommend something that's been instrumental to my my recovery and my feeling better has been joining groups. So NAMI Santa Cruz, where I work, I work for them because they changed my life. Um, there are support groups. So you can go to, we have a ton of young adults. Right now, everything is offered on Zoom. So we have support groups Monday, Wednesday, and Friday afternoons. And again, whatever affiliate that, that is in your county, they're probably doing Zoom groups right now as well. Um, there's a lot of young adults that come to them and we talk about everything. Any there's It's a really beautiful place where you can uh, meet other people who are going through similar experiences where you can share what's going on with you and get resources from people who have lived it and people who can say, oh, you're feeling this way. I felt that way yesterday. Here's what I did. This might help you. This might not help you. But either way, here's a place to share um, and to be with other people who get it and who truly understand. Um, if that's not feeling like your jam, it took me a really long time to get to a support group. Um, and again, you can always join one and just sit there. You don't have to, you don't have to sit, sit say anything. You can just listen. Um, really good place to start is your primary care doctor. So just going to your doctor, you don't have to spill your whole, none of these, you have to spill your whole life story. You don't have to go to, to these places and say like, here's all my trauma from my past, you know, 26 years of living and here's everything that I'm doing wrong. And you can just say like, I'm feeling kind of weird. Well, can you, can you give, point me to some resources? Can you, do you have any tools that I can use at this moment? Um, and again, your primary care doctor is a really good place to start because you already have that uh, relationship developed. So, so chances are they'll be able to fi find you a provider, um, a professional that can work with you and that you fit with. Cause that's also a really important part of finding, um, finding, finding support is somebody that you can trust. Calling NAMI Santa Cruz, I will put our information at the end of uh, this slideshow. Chances are if you call us, uh, you will probably talk to me because I am I'm, I work there full time and I'm it's me and one other person who answers the phone. So um, you might reach me and I'm happy to talk to you about any questions that you might have, point you in the right directions. CAPS. Yes. Uh, so things might have changed. I, I'm, I'm also a UCSC alumni um, as of four years ago, but I remember with CAPS, um, it was really difficult to get a timely appointment. And usually when I needed help, they were like, sorry, you have to wait for two months. So I really highly, I really regret not making an appointment regardless. Um, I really wish that I'd made that appointment and just, you know, had kept it even if it was two months in advance as just something um, to put in place as something I know I'm doing for my mental health. Also, they are very connected with other local resources. So if they can't, you can't, they can't get you an appointment on time, they will connect you to somebody outside of them um, or in, more in town. So I just reach out to them, um, say, hey, I'm looking for support, I'm looking for help. Again, the earlier that, re that you reach out, the better. Doing research is very, very, uh, can be very helpful and feel very validating. Um, the only reason that I got support when I got support, which unfortunately ended up being a hospitalization, um, on the bright side, it was very helpful. But I, when I, I got my, I was, I got hospitalized for the first time when I was 16, and it was really only because I told my parents, hey, I need mental health help. And I really only knew and kind of, or had an inkling that it was mental, my, my issues were mental health related because I was doing research of my own at the time. Um, again, I had diagnosed myself before then, which made it really hard to accept my actual diagnosis of bipolar disorder. But it also got me to the point where I was like, oh yeah, this is a real thing, and there's support out there that I can get for it. Um, NAMI.org has, all kinds of information, anything that you could possibly ask about mental health, um, it's all on there. There's forums, blogs, um, uh, evidence-based practices, and uh, thorough information about, I think, all the diagnoses, most of the diagnoses, at least, um, that you could think of. And there's also, like, aside from NAMI, <laughs> which I talk about a lot because, again, they've helped me a lot, not just because I work for them, it's the other way around. Um, 
there's lots of great other other literature out there. So if you, you know, you you know, maybe you already have a diagnosis and you're like working with a couple of providers, but it's not really doing that much, um, or it's, you know, you're you want something more. Check, again, Google it, check it out, check out to see what what are the different self-help books out there. There's are there, there's different forums out there. There's different sites that you can read other people's stories and get in touch with different communities. Instagram can be actually, I, I follow some great accounts, um, Soul Pancake and Crown Health, I think, um, that really helped. Like they gave me some some nice reminders in the beginning of my day uh, to, to maintain my mental health. So there's a lot, there's a lot out there. Um, Again, it's a really good place to start. Just putting it in the browser of of your computer. You know what? How to help with mania? How to help with anxiety? What to do with panic attack? Right. Uh, the third thing that is can be really life changing is managing stress. So I know that when we're in college, we want to do everything and more, and we have all of this pressure on ourselves to finish in four years or five years. Um, you know, because we're spending lots of money. And um, we have to ace all our classes because we want to get a good job or we want to go to graduate school. It's a lot of pressure, right? And so it's really important when you know you're struggling with your mental health, um, it's really important to try to prioritize that. And yes, like some of us have, like, you know, it's, it's really important for us to do really well in school. Um, and so it's important to be able to find that balance, right? Not giving one up for the other, because if you don't take care of your mental health, um, chances are it's not going to get better on its own and it, it might impede in your goals and timeline later on. So again, if you're finding yourself struggling right now, right now is the time to get support. Um, something that was so helpful for me that I wish I had done way early in my senior year, it was when I was really struggling and I was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm done with school. Um, that's when I decided to take, I think, uh, at least two classes pass fail and oh my God, it made such a difference. Please do that for yourself. I think, I, again, I don't know if things have changed, but when I was there, you had like a certain number of classes that you could take pass fail throughout the year. Just do it, really. Um, it's It makes a world of difference. It is, it, it, especially classes where you know, you're like, I, <laughs> I took an electrical engineering class. I'm like a psychology nerd, not a science person, um, a social science person, not a whatever other science person. Uh, and I did not do well. The only reason I did well is because like the curve was so high or the only reason I passed was because the curve was so high. Um, but that's a class I should have taken pass fail. So please do that. It will really help to manage your stress. And like I said, stress really catalyzes a lot of our mental health conditions. Um, and again, with our mental health, we have to manage our expectations. Maybe we can't be working 16 hours a day. Maybe we can't be working eight hours a day and also going to school full time. Um, again, because that is something that 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 w might impede on your success later on if it's something that's not addressed now. Um, Take time for a rest practice or a fun practice in your schedule, right? Even if it's five minutes, even if you know you wake up for five minutes in the morning and you meditate or, you know, you stretch out or whatever, um, just take that time to breathe. I, I recommend if you have no time, if you're like, no, I don't have anything, like taking those five minute breaks in the morning, afternoon, and evening, that can be really good too um, for your mind to just know like, oh, I have this break coming soon. And it can help you get more in touch with what, what your needs are. Um, and also really important to set boundaries. So again, along with your academic pressure right now, you probably actually have some family pressure right now being a lot of you being at home with your parents or families. Um, and then on top of that social pressure, right? And uh, like our own personal stuff as well. Um, so learn to say no, you don't wanna go to a party, don't go to that party, it's okay. Like your friends will still be around even if you don't wanna go to a party or if you don't even wanna go out with them. Um, it was really important for me to be able to speak up and say, hey, I'm having a bad mental health day. Can I just text you for this one minute and then I'll then I'll get back to you in like a week, right? And and being being able to like, oh, I made plans and I'm like, I, I need to sleep today. Um, reaching out to my friends and just saying, hey, I really need the sleep today. Can we reschedule? Can we postpone? Uh, it's really good and it can help you also feel like you have a sense of agency over what's going on, which again can kind of help settle your your brain a little bit. Um, so those are some quick tips. Again, there's a lot of other information out there and your mental health providers will also give you a lot of tools and tricks as to how, how to really um, uh, have good mental health and have better mental health, maintain it. Uh, how to help a friend. So I would say the most important thing that you can do as a friend is this last point, to support them no matter what. Um, 
I really, I got really tired of having to explain myself uh, or like get advice that I wasn't looking for from friends um, to the point where I was just like, I don't even want to talk to you about what's going on with my mental health. So, so being that friend who says, Hey, you're having like a hard day today. I love you. And like, that's okay. And you know, even when you do try to have those conversations with them of like, Hey, I found this resource. Um, would you be willing to check it out? And they say, no, being like, that's fine. I love you. What do you want to do today? Or do you want to hang out next week? Um, so that unconditional love is really, it's, we're finding over and over again, that um, part of being successful in recovering from mental health conditions is having a support system around. Um, so again, that can be family, chosen family, that can be one person, that can be, um, yeah, a anybody that you choose really. A and it's, it's a really good time to be a, a good friend if you know your friend is struggling with mental health challenges. Helpful language is really important. So there's a lot of stigma when it comes to people with mental health conditions. My favorite thing to do with language is um, a lot of people say, he or she is bipolar, he or she, he or she or they are uh, schizophrenic. And I, that for, that makes it feel like that whole person is just their identity, is their disorder, really. So what I like to say is I have bipolar disorder. I live with schizophrenia. I experience um, ADHD, right? So that that's something he he she experiences it. He he she has obsessive compulsive disorder, right? So so these things that kind of ha help help people understand that it's just part of their identity. It's not it's not a whole it's not their whole personality. Um, so reduce that and also um, helpful language in terms of you know getting support and getting help and and. Uh, asking people about their mental health, there's lots of great open-ended questions of like, hey, like, how are you taking care of yourself today? How are you doing physically and mentally today? Um, asking, be, be really normalizing the fact that talking about mental health is okay, because a lot of people who are struggling don't feel that it is. I know I didn't. Doing research for them. So for, um, for a lot of us struggling with mental health challenges, it can be really hard to even get out of bed in the morning, much less make a whole ass appointment. So being a friend who, you can kind of look it up on the side, you know, like without, if you feel like your friend isn't ready to talk to you yet, just kind of having those things available for when they are can be really helpful. Or talk, or when you do have that conversation, say like, hey, do you want my help looking for a provider? If you're in a place where you're like feeling good and you want to support someone, say, here's what I can do. I can Google some names of therapists for you. Um, I can drive you to your appointment, right? I can, here's the number to call for NAMI. Here's, I got this contact for you from this mental health organization. I think um, you can reach them Monday through Friday, 11 to three or whatever, right? So that can really eliminate a bunch of barriers for it because getting mental health resources, it can be, it can really feel like jumping through hoops. Um, so if you're in that place where you have that bandwidth, that can be a great thing to do. Planning things they love to do, right? It might not line up with your idea of what you love to do. You might want to party and go out and socialize and be in loud places. And they might really want to just chill at home and like not really talk to you for very, that's me. I'm actually speaking from my experience. I would like my ideal place is like, I'm watching movies for six hours with my friends and we're not saying anything to each other. That's like what I, what I really like to do and what helps, helps me feel really um, stable and, and, and good and happy. So, so planning things that they love to do and, you know, not, not getting upset if they, if they cancel plans or what have you. Um, it's a real thing. Again, men mental health conditions are real and it's important to understand there's limitations to that. And here's this wonderful collage of celebrities who ba -da -ba -ba, have mental health conditions and not just have them, they are also advocates of having mental health conditions. Um, Demi Lovato lives with bipolar disorder and struggles with substance use. As many of you know, I love her. Um, JFK, oh my gosh, I don't want to misdiagnose him, but I think he lives with, uh, he lived with ADHD. Um, really interesting. Some, one of the more kind of, uh, the, one of the, one of the less common mental, mental illnesses. He has that, he had that. Um, and Leonardo DiCaprio also lives with, lives with obsessive compulsive disorder, which is really fascinating to me when I learned that. And also Serena Williams lives with depression. You can, I, I have like a list of these people, um, but I don't have it on me right now. So if you recognize anyone, look up, um, you know, this person, and mental health condition, and you'll be able to find what it is that they live with. So this is all to say that having a mental health condition, having mental health challenges does not have to limit you. You can still live a beautiful, successful life um, having a mental health condition. 
So please remember, mental health conditions are medical conditions. They have symptoms, they're treatable, there's resources, there's providers for you. It's not your fault, it's not anybody's fault, it's just the way that your brain is. Um, maybe it's just the way your brain is at this moment. And you are not alone. One in four people struggle with a mental health condition, probably more. And recovery is absolutely possible. There is hope. Um, our lives are just changed. So I, speaking from my own experience, I could not have imagined being as stable and as happy as I am today, um, even five years ago when I literally could not leave my room because I was feeling so much anxiety and isolation and depression. So um, just know hope is out there. There's resources for you. And so here's, here's us, NAMI Santa Cruz, really good place to start. Here's our website, namiscc.org. Um, you'll find our, all of our support groups on there. That's a really good place to start. Monday, Wednesday, Friday afternoon support uh, Zoom groups. Please join us, LGBTQ friendly. Um, this is our office line. We're not at the office right now, but we are getting voicemails remotely. So call us, leave a message, and we'll probably get back to you within the day. This is my name. This is my title. And you can also email me, Anastasia at namiscc.org. I would love to hear from you guys. Um, any questions that you might have? Um, yeah. So without further ado, oh, I also meant to give you guys the suicide prevention line. Um, give me one second. 1-800-273-8255, 1-800-273-8255. Please program that into, all of you, please program that into your phone right now, 1-800-273-8255. Again, you don't have to be in a crisis to call them. You can just call them and, and be like, just to talk. They're very, they're not gonna call the police on you. It's not that, that's actually like their last resort. They just wanna talk to you and help you feel better and help make a plan with you to help you feel safe. Um, so without further ado, thank you guys for listening. Um, I'm gonna pause this recording. You're probably not gonna notice because I'm gonna resume it, um, but I'm gonna pause this recording and let Katie into the room for her to share her story with you guys. Okay, so my name is Katie. I'm 21 years old. I live in Scotts Valley um, and I live here all my life. Um, and I have a very long, complicated history with mental illness um, and, you know, overcoming it and um, share with you guys a little bit about my experiences through it. Um, so I started noticing um, that I was different from other kids when I was pretty young. Um, and uh, by the time I was 11, I definitely knew there was just something about the way my brain worked that was different from other people. Um, I just process things a little bit differently. Uh, and all of a sudden, like overnight, it felt like a switch just kind of went off. Um, I remember sitting in math class one day um, and I was writing down uh, just, you know, simple uh, algebra equations. And I remember trying to write in eight. Um, I could picture the eight in my head. Um, and the only thing my hand was drawing was an S on the paper over and over and over. And I remember feeling very confused and frustrated, um, and I didn't totally understand what was going on. Um, soon after that, I started feeling very helpless, very hopeless, um, and very powerless. Uh, I started having these thoughts of, I don't fit in with these people, I don't belong here, um, and I don't know if I want to continue living like this. When I was 12 years old, uh, that was the first time I had reached out to one of my friends and told them, hey, I think I am, I, I don't wanna be here anymore. I think I want to kill myself. Um, I don't think I can live with these feelings anymore. And he told his mom who in turn told my parents and my parents' first reaction was, um, Katie, you are causing a scene, like you need to stop this um, because you're creating drama. And at 12 years old, I took that to mean that I can never tell anyone about my feelings ever again. Um, I started self-harming and when I was 13, my mom saw my scars and she decided that it was time for me to get some professional help. Um, that was the first time I was introduced to therapy. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and so I told the therapist what I thought she wanted to hear. Um, and even that wasn't totally enough uh, because she recommended I see a psychiatrist and maybe start medication. So uh, 14 was my first experience with um, being on antidepressants um, and I didn't know I was over medicated at the time and uh, it didn't it worked for a little bit I started 
being able to taste food again. I started being able to talk to my friends again. Um, and after a few months, it left just as quickly as it came. Uh, once again, the world started seeming very dull and I started not being able to get out of bed in the morning. Um, and around that time was when I first discovered uh, self-medication through substances. Um, and that for me, I thought that was the answer. I thought, oh, like, I don't need all these pharmaceutical drugs. So I can just fix the problem uh, through, through stealing illegal substances and doing what I want to do. Um, let's see. So by the time I was 15, um, I had a very rocky relationship with my parents because of my substance abuse issues. And um, it stopped working for me. The substances didn't make me feel better anymore. I was on um, a few different psychiatric medications at that time. I had stopped seeing my therapist and I had stopped being able to get out of bed in the morning. Um, I was, my body just felt so extraordinarily heavy. Uh, and I, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. Um, the world was seeming very, very, very hopeless. Um, and that was like one of the lowest points I remember feeling. And so I thought maybe if I just use more substances, it'll fix this, um, because it used to fix it in the past. And so I kind of dove a little heavier into that. And this went on for a few more years, um, until I was 17. And one of my doctors recommended that I maybe talk to these people at Stanford who were doing uh, research on this um, new new disease they were playing around with, not playing around with, this new disease that they were kind of discovering. Um, and so I went up to Stanford and I did a lot of tests, I did a lot of blood work and I talked to their psychiatrist. Um, and that was when I got my official diagnosis, uh, which is PANS or PANDAS, uh, which stands for Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. And um, what this means is that uh, it wasn't just a mental illness for me. It was uh, my immune system attacking my brain. So whenever my body was fighting off some sort of virus or some sort of infection, my immune system would overreact and um, attack the basal ganglia in my brain. Um, because of this, I experienced intense mood swings. Uh, some days I would be unable to get out of bed and other days I felt like I wanted to set the world on fire because I was so happy. Um, and at 17, you know, I was bittersweet about this diagnosis. I was happy I finally had a possible answer to my problems and I was terrified because this meant a whole new set of treatment. Um, at that point, you know, I was still abusing substances and um, I was too ashamed to tell anyone about it, especially now that I was seeing doctors at Stanford. Um, and so I kept that part very private um, and I started new treatments at Stanford. And even though I was on other medication and I was on substances, the treatments that they gave to me actually um, started working. Uh, it took a little bit of time. It took a lot of trial and error, um, but you know, by the time I was 19, I started seeing real results from these treatments, and that was when I had to face the fact that I was also a drug addict. Um, the disease of addiction is part of my story, and I do call it a disease because uh, it is something I cannot control, that I don't have any power over, just like my mental illnesses. Um, and so I was, I think I was, just turned 20 when I started seeking help for my uh, substance addiction. Um, today, things are manageable. My autoimmune disease, I have been in remission for about a year. Um, I don't have to have the intense treatments anymore. I am still on maintenance medication. I have a therapist that I talk to on the phone weekly, um, and I am I'm a good participant in therapy. I'm honest, I'm open, I'm vulnerable, um, and that has saved my life. I've also been sober for a little over a year now, um, and that also has saved my life. Um, I have a very strong support group uh, through NAMI, through other programs, through um, you know my family. And uh, honestly, I've finally gotten to a point to where I might not be happy all the time, but I am content. I am fully content of where I am at this point in life. And I think that's the most that I can ask for. Um, and I'm satisfied with that. Um, 
quarantine has been gnarly. Quarantine has been a little rough. Um, it definitely, you know, I'm not good with change. I'm not good with things not being planned. And so, um, it definitely uprooted all of us from our normal routine. And that was really hard for me to face at first, but just like with everything else in my life, you know, you have to go through a process of surrender of, um, being okay with not being in control all the time, which is difficult, but it's doable. Um, and so, in quarantine, you know, I have had to step aside from my full-time job. Um, and I have had to step up to talking more, uh, to my friends, to my family, to my therapist, um, to people in my support system and being honest with how I'm doing. It hasn't all been good. Uh, in fact, a lot of it has been really bad, um, but I'm getting through it. And, um, today I'm okay. Today I'm doing really well. Um, there's a lot of a lot of different solutions for mental illness and for dealing with these kinds of things and i think the key is to just you know to do whatever you can to find what works for you um no matter what that looks like um i think that's all i have to say <laughs> was that like two minutes <laughs> Hey, yeah, it was perfect. Thank okay, you so cool. much for sharing your story. You are such a bright light and so articulate. And um, I think you're going to inspire a lot of hope for people. So thank you, thank you so much. And we'll see you at our uh, Q&A on Tuesday. I will let yes. you know more details about that. Awesome. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye. Cool. All right. That went seamlessly. I'm really happy about that. Um, uh, next, we're going to have ja Jasmine call in and she's also going to share her story and you guys will also see her during the Q&A um, on Tuesday. I hope that's the right day. I don't know. Days don't even make sense anymore. Um, so again, I'm going to pause the recording real quick and let her into the room. All right, everybody, uh, this is Jasmine. She's gonna share her story with you guys as well. Take it away, Jasmine, when you're ready. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, yes, I'm Jasmine, and I go by Jazz. Um, and I am here to tell you about my story with mental health. Um, I also you know, just wanted to start with an introduction, though, of who I am. Um, I'm married. Um, I have two cats, Fluff and Floof, who are quite adorable. Um, I enjoy volunteering, and that's why I like working with NAMI. Um, before COVID-19, um, I really enjoyed going out for food or movies with friends and family. And both before and now, I um, have really gotten into the Big Bang Theory, a little late to the game, um, and watched that kind of on loop. I also like to play um, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Uh, it's the only game I've enjoyed so far. Um, one interesting fact about me is that I was adopted when I was six months old from one of Mother Teresa's orphanages in Dhaka, Bangladesh. I was brought to California and LA, and then I've been working my way north ever since. Um, went to San Luis Obispo for um, high school, and then after that came up here for, um, for college up to the Bay Area, and I've been in Santa Cruz for about six years now. So my journey started more or less in high school. Um, I noticed I was feeling really left out, kind of angry a lot, um, would have these sort of outbursts at my friends, feeling like, you know, just nobody cared about me. There's one example where I was at the beach with um, a group of friends and with a really good friend, I just ended up shouting at him, I hate you, and then taking off down a strip of highway. And that was when I realized, you know, that wasn't just the general teenage angst and, um, uh, luckily, with the help of my family, I was able to see a therapist who diagnosed me with uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, uh, PMDD, which is like PMS, but um, more, just more uh, intense. And I managed that with the therapy and a medication. Um, then I went off to college. I went to Stanford, and things were going pretty well in the beginning. But my um, winter quarter, we went on a ski trip and I experienced rejection by a boy I really liked, and I did not take it well. Um, I ended up texting my mom, I want to die, which is the first time I had said something like that. So needless to say, she was really scared. Um, and I found myself, when I got back to campus, just kind of having passive suicidal ideation. So then I got really scared and went to the counseling center. 
they ended up initiating um, a 5150, which is a 72 hour psychiatric hold. Um, and it was really scary. I mean, my parents had to fly up from um, LA. Luckily, my uncle and aunt lived close by and they came to help me kind of settle in. Um, and it was there that I got my diagnosis of bipolar disorder type two. So my symptoms ranged from just being really happy and kind of elated, talking fast, and I already talk fast, so that's really saying something, to, um, you know, and, and then staying up all night thinking I had figured out the meaning of life or just a lot of kind of questions I was pondering, um, all the way to just agitation and anger. Honestly, I was sometimes kind of just mean, especially to people closest to me. Um, and then I had a lot of depression, um, which looked like uh, sophomore year, just kind of lying on the ground, even though uh, in my room, even though I had a roommate who was trying to work and eventually she did move out because she said it was just too uh, disruptive to her academics. I also had a lot of desperation crying, begging for help over and over, like, you have to help me, you have to help me, um, you know, either towards my mom or boyfriend at the time, or even people I wasn't that close to, but somehow had thought I was close to. Um, so the consequences of all this were that I ended up um, taking two leaves of absence while I was at Stanford. Um, one of them was following, basically um, having to withdraw from classes late, so I got put on academic probation. Um, and in all this, I was hospitalized twice more. What I can say is all those experiences were vastly different with the hospitalizations. Um, and by the third one, I was at Stanford Hospital. And as a student there, it made it almost fun, which is weird to say, but I was with other people who I felt, you know, understood what I was going through. They were around my age. There was someone else there who was also a senior trying to graduate. Um, so I was able to return to Stanford after that and graduate, even though it was a year after, um, you know, I intended to. So after that, I kind of struggled in the job world. Um, same thing with the mood reactivity. Um, there was one job where I didn't get along very well with the manager and um, one day in a meeting, she wouldn't let me ask a question, but she let other people ask questions. And I didn't understand that. I got furious. I ended up slamming my pen down and going to the bathroom to cry. And I got fired later that day. So that led to a shame spiral and depression that kind of took me out for a month. I was just in bed a lot, not taking care of myself. And my husband would come and just kind of coax me out with, uh, you know, nice meals out, things like that, which kind of created a issue I have with food, which persists to this day. Um, and after a while, I was able to get into a, a partial hospitalization program, which was during the day, lots of therapy, group therapy, um, but not overnight. And it was there that um, inspiration kind of struck, and I decided I would like to be a therapist. Um, I realized I had been on the other end for so long, I wanted to know what it was like on the other side of the couch, and I wanted to kind of give back to other people who kind of suffered like I had. Um, so I, I moved pretty decisively and I was able to graduate my partial hospitalization program on a Friday and start grad school on a Monday. <laughs> um, and you know, there were some ups and downs during that, but I got through it again with my support system. So I thought my struggles were over after grad school because, you know, hadn't I been through enough? Um, but then partway through my internship, um, with one of my coworkers slash friends, we ended up having just this huge fight. In Hawaii um, and she was mentioning a lot like that you know well when my best friend was here we did this and my best friend and I did this and with my absolute thinking I kind of thought well if I'm not her best friend then I'm just nothing and so then I um, I convinced myself she didn't even want me there and I just stormed off in a huff and left Hawaii on a separate flight home I mean it was like who leaves Hawaii and so when I got back I was not doing well with functioning, just kind of deteriorating at work too. So I ended up taking a leave of absence um, from work for about five weeks. At that time, I had a therapist who also told me she couldn't work with me anymore because her skill set didn't match what I needed, uh, which was devastating at first, um, but led me to kind of realize that 
um, just realized on my own that I actually meet criteria for borderline personality disorder, um, which she, she agreed and so did my psychiatrist. And that helped me feel a lot of relief at first um, because it, it made sense of the symptoms I had. Um, but then I felt a lot of fear and internalized stigma because you know, just, I've encountered more stigma for that diagnosis. And the current thought by my psychiatrist is that I'm somewhere at the intersection of the two of bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder. So what helps for me, the primary thing, as I've kind of um, talked about, is just being open and honest with my support system. So my mom, my boyfriend through college, and then my husband now. Um, also therapy and psychiatry have been huge for me. I've done dialectical behavior therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, I've found DBT, the dialectical behavior therapy, really helpful because um, the four modules for me were just really big. There's mindfulness, interpersonal effectiveness, emotion regulation, and distress tolerance, uh, which I benefited from all of them. At one point I was still doing pretty badly, so I um, did ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, um, and that it was much less scary than the media has made it look out to be. And um, it's, it was an outpatient procedure. Um, I was made to have a gentle seizure. My understanding is that helps kind of reset the brain. Um, and it did bring me out of a pretty dark place. Now I'm just going to pause to say I know this is a lot of treatments, a lot of therapies. And um, I say it because, well, it's part of my journey, but also just to give you exposure to just how many things there are out there. So after the ECT, I tried TMS, and that's kind of where I wore this helmet that um, sends a magnetic pulse like deep into the brain, again, to kind of help reset it. Um, I've done trauma techniques like EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing, and uh, brain spotting, and found uh, EMDR helpful for me. And then medication, trial and error. It took a lot. Um, I had to try dozens of medications. and I say that not to discourage anyone, but just because I wish I had known that there was light at the end of the tunnel and that for some people, you know, it, like for me, it just took more uh, try, trial and error. And NAMI classes really helped. Um, my mom took the family to family class and it helped her understand how to support me and um, help me while still maintaining her own boundaries. And then the NAMI peer to peer class is something I took later. And it helped me break down stigma I had towards even other mental illnesses. And um, recently what helped me the most was just that idea that I meet the criteria for borderline personality disorder because it helped lead me to um, treatment that uh, one of the gold standards and something I had found helpful was the DBT. And so I'm committed to the full program, going through the group the second time. Um, and uh, it's really helping. I see recovery as an ongoing process. Um, I don't have to be recovered to have a fulfilling life because despite everything I've told you and that I went through, I was able to adopt my cats, get married. Um, now I'm in this treatment I really like. I'm an associate marriage and family therapist at Family Service Agency, um, passed my law and ethics exam, and I'm over halfway through my hours to my license. Um, so what's next for me is I think, you know, I want to get my license and continue at the agency, but also maybe add a private practice. Um, I view uh, progress as not directly linear, um, but I do think that, you know, if the intensity, duration, or frequency of my episodes decreases, that that is success and that is progress. So now I can focus on my um, struggles with food. And honestly, it's, it's very annoying that I came out of this with yet another problem. Um, but as my mom said, you know, it might have been what helped me survive. It might have been just the coping mechanism that I, that I needed at the time. And now I have the bandwidth to kind of tackle it. So I view the PMDD bipolar slash borderline personality disorder as things I live with. Much as, uh, you know, my mom lives with um, arthritis or my uncle lives with diabetes, things like that. And, you know, I validate that it's not fair, um, but that everyone has something to deal with. And if you don't, like, you don't have any physical or mental ailments, you know, you're just super lucky, like my husband, then um, 
then I'd say maybe you have more more bandwidth to help people who are struggling and help loved ones. Uh, I wanted to just touch on how the pandemic has been affecting my mental health. And um, I think all this underlying stress has led to heightened anxiety for me. Uh, I'm more easily set off. It's harder to return to baseline. So things throughout the day can keep kind of, you know, ratcheting it up. I also have been experiencing a lot of fear, um, fear and almost terror just from everything from like bugs outside when I'm inside, you know, which I didn't used to be that afraid to um, like fear of calling clients when I have business to conduct, things like that. Um, in fact, recently I just had an episode and had to reschedule a couple clients and, um, and felt a lot of shame and had to work on that self stigma that even I can't take a mental health day because I'm a therapist or I should know better. or I should be better by now. Um, so in general, it's just helpful to remember that this ambient stress is chipping away at my resiliency. So I do things to try to help bolster that, which is um, like taking naps or playing my game um, or just taking breaks. So looking to the future, I'm currently intrigued with either becoming a DBT therapist or um, contributing some way to borderline personality disorder research. Um, I just feel my suffering wasn't for nothing if I can help other people suffer at just at least a little bit less or not feel alone in the journey. Um, at a minimum, I really believe in chipping away at stigma, which is why I share my story and why I am here talking to you. Jazz, thank you so much for sharing your incredible story of resilience and all your wisdom. I love hearing your story every single time. And we'll see you at our uh, Q&A on Tuesday at noon. Yeah. Cool. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. You too. Uh, Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, everybody. That's the end of our show. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening, for tuning in. Uh, we hope to see you on Tuesday at noon for our live Q&A. If you have any questions that have come up during this qu uh, presentation, write them down so you don't forget. We really look forward to seeing you and chatting with you. Thank you and take care of your mental health.